grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The word of God that we meditate on this morning is part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the words that you have heard from Matthew chapter 5. Dear friends in Christ, it was about 18 years ago that Katie Couric of NBC News had conducted an interview with a, with a woman by the name of Jennifer. Jennifer had splashed in the news suddenly because she suddenly disappeared shortly before her wedding. And so the media was all over it. The police were all over it. They were, they were looking desperately for her. And finally they found out it was a hoax. She actually, about a week before her wedding, had grabbed a Greyhound bus and just took off. She became known as the runaway bride. In the interview, Katie Couric asked her, well, Jennifer, what is it that you hope people will take away from this interview? And the young woman replied, I hope that people will allow me to learn who I truly am so I hope that as I go through this healing process and start to learn more about myself, accept myself, love myself for who I am, then everybody else will too, and that I will no longer be the runaway bride. Then maybe a lot of these people could call me friend or call me by my real name, Jennifer. So we are here today to be able to remind ourselves of who we truly are. We probably have to admit, like Jennifer, that there are some things about us that we really aren't very fond of. Things that may not make the national news, but things that nonetheless would raise eyebrows if others knew about them, things that we have done wrong, bad decisions that we have made, things by which we would not want to be identified. But again, we want to remind ourselves of our true identity. In the second lesson from Peter, you heard Peter say these words, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people who are God's own possession. You have been chosen by God. Just as God chose the Israelites in the Old Testament, God chooses you. And not only that, you are royalty, part of the royal priesthood of believers. You can take your intercessions directly to God. Jesus is your only mediator. You have been set apart as a holy nation, set apart to do God's will. You belong to God. You are God's own possession. That is your true identity. And as such, Jesus, in his sermon, talks about what you also are, how that identity is so important to the world. He pictures you as salt. He pictures you as light. Now, he doesn't say you need to become salt, you need to become light. No, he says you are salt, you are light. And as a Christian, that is a part of your identity. Just as salt has been used as a preservative, you as Christians are preservatives in this world. Just as light reveals things that wouldn't otherwise be revealed, that's your calling. You are the light of the world to a world that so desperately needs to step out of the darkness and, and see what truth is. 
And so why does God utilize us as salt and light? Well, without Christians in the world, the world would be a much worse place in which to live. Without Christians, there would be no one to point to what the world so desperately needs, the way to salvation. Left to itself, the world would only destroy itself. The reason for that is the fact that the world wants to pave its own way to salvation, right? The thinking goes along these lines. I'll try to be the best version of me, and then good will come my way. If there is a God, then he surely is going to love me. Sure, I do some things wrong, but I can overcome those. My good outweighs my bad. Or at the very least, at least I'm better than that schmo over there, right? That's the way the world thinks. And when that kind of thinking takes over, the world needs to hear Jesus' words. Amen, I tell you. Until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Here's a concept that's completely foreign to the world. God's law is constant. His moral law does not change. That law we often summarize and God summarizes really first in the Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments still stand. The world looks at it a little bit differently. The world looks at the The sixth commandment, you shall not commit adultery, and and says, well, that's largely outdated. But God's will still stands. Marriage still is a lifelong commitment. Marriage still consists of one man and one woman. Sex is reserved only for husband and wife. Lusting after someone who's not your spouse is a sin. So how does the sinful nature try to excuse those things? Well, as long as two people really love each other, then they can consensually sleep together. As long as two people love each other, they they can get married, even if that means they are of the same gender. And that lustful thought that you had about that man or about that woman... Well, it didn't hurt anyone. Well, what do these attitudes do? They fail to take God's law seriously as it needs to be taken. Break the law once, even if it's a sinful thought, then you've broken the whole law. Even more than that, breaking God's law has serious consequences. It means, finally, eternal death. That's the message that society needs to hear. They need to hear that God won't listen to excuses for sin. They need to know that God will not tolerate us taking sin lightly. And so what's our role? Well, our role is not to ignore sin. Our job is not to pretend like we don't see anything happening. Our job is to shine a light on it and expose it to the light. Do you feel like, well, who am I? Who am I to do that? Who am I to know what my friend or coworker needs? Remember, you are God's chosen people a people belonging to God. God made you who you are, and as such, he brought you to faith in Jesus as your Savior. The fact that you believe in Jesus is evidence 
that you too have admitted that you are morally bankrupt by nature, that you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so that means you're qualified, uniquely qualified. You can be a light to others. That means that you not only are going to point out the sin, but also the need for a Savior. And not only do you talk about the need for a Savior, you can identify who that Savior is. You know that Savior is Jesus Christ. When Jesus came to earth, some had the misimpression that Jesus was now going to simply get rid of the law in its entirety. Yes, Jesus did get get rid of some of the law, you could say, because he fulfilled some of it and no longer was necessary, sacrificing to animals. The civil laws that governed the nation of Israel, those are no more intact. But as we said before, the moral law of God is still intact. And so Jesus reminds us, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Jesus didn't come to change the rules. He came to follow them. To follow them perfectly, as the law demands. He came to do everything God wants mankind to do, but couldn't do. And he did it flawlessly. Yes, Jesus did that because we couldn't. We can hardly go a day or an hour without breaking God's law in some way. And so what good did Jesus following the the rules do for us since we still don't do them ourselves? The Apostle Paul said, For in the gospel... A righteousness from God is revealed by faith, for for faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. You know that you have salvation by faith, and by faith you believe that Jesus' righteousness is your righteousness. His perfection is your perfection. He kept everything for you, and he died for all the times you broke the law. He died to wash away every sin. Jesus did it for you and for me, and we get all the credit. Remember who you are. Know your identity. Redeemed children of God, yes. And the Lord spoke through Moses and in the first lesson, and said, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. And you heard the apostle Peter already expand on that by saying, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people who are God's own possession. And Jesus tells you through Matthew, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. That is who you are. And as such, you are reminded to be just that. Peter reminds you that you are are these things so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are to give voice to to God's salvation and draw attention to him. Yes, you are the light of the world because of Jesus. You are the light of the world for Jesus to let the world know all about him with your voice. And finally, Peter tells us another way that we are to be the light of the world live an honorable life among the Gentiles so that even though they slander you as evildoers, when they observe your noble deeds, 
they may glorify God on the day he visits us. As Christians, remember who you are and remember to live your life accordingly. Receive regular nourishment from his word and sacrament. Love God by doing his will. Love those around you. Remember that others are watching as well. May they look at your life and wonder why you act so differently than the world around you. May they be drawn to you so that you can point them to the way of salvation through Jesus Christ and his cross. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.